20 things I learned writing the Dawnbreaker saga. A list of advice I should probably revisit in the future. Number one, medium specific flaws. Good character flaws are ones that you can actually act on. In this case, I was limited by what I could do in game. Ingrath's cowardice and Arden's insecurity worked really well because I could use in-game mechanics and decisions to reflect them. This is part of the reason I struggled with making Kiddo and Yarnvita compelling. Their flaws were either really difficult to roleplay or not well-defined enough to work with. Could I have done them justice in a different form of story, like a novel? Maybe. I think I pulled them into shape right at the end, but they were still pretty wobbly there for a while. Something I found useful in making good role-playable character flaws has actually been the character flaw tables from 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Those lists were compiled specifically for situations like this, and they make for an excellent jumping off point. Number two, goals as creep repellent. Setting goalposts is really helpful for avoiding scope creep and mod creep. For example, Zaytest's original goalpost was the end of the Dark Brotherhood quest. Arden's was defeating Harkon. Kinoa's was, obviously, killing Alduin. Those goalposts ended up moving a bit over the course of adding mods and two main characters, but I didn't plan for the Civil War or anything after it until I got to Harkon and Alduin and realized there was way more story to tell, and that yes, I was going to go all the way through to Mirak. The point is, having a place where I could either cap off the story or keep it going kept my restartitis in check a little bit. The next round of characters sort of have goalposts, but part of my pre-production work is going to be going into defining in more detail where they're going and with whom. Number three, Pico's Hank on tools. There will always be somebody with better gear. Ultimately, it's about getting the job done with what you've got. Pico's Hank. I can share all the tools of the trade that I want, but the power isn't in the tool, it's in the user. And Skyrim is a tool. This is why I shy away from giving my opinion on mods or mod lists or anything like that. Just because my computer can't handle 4K textures, parallax, and the snazziest, most up-to-date E and B, doesn't mean I can't make a decent-looking game and tell a story with it. Number four, don't start big. Another tip for avoiding scope slash spectacle creep, don't start big. Up like a rocket, down like a rock, especially since Skyrim tends to be a cruel mistress in the long term. The smaller you start, like with a random scholar traveling to Skyrim because he's got a letter about an excavation, the more room you have to slowly grow the story. Never be afraid to dial it back a little bit if it's getting to be too much. This is part of the reason why I had to end Dawnbreakers and move on, by the way. The production time on the few of those later script-heavy episodes was in the days rather than the hours, and I was getting really burnt out making them. Obviously, I'll still be doing those scripted cutscenes in the future, but for the moment, I'll be happy just getting back to a nice gameplay baseline again. Number five, perfect versus good. Here's something I learned on a random YouTube rabbit hole journey into watching city planner plays. Try not to let perfect get in the way of good. Done is good. Good enough is good enough. And this applies to all kinds of things. Maybe your voice is a little rough around the edges like mine is this morning or you're recording on a potato, or your story has plot holes in it large enough to park the Death Star. Start where you are, and you will improve along the way. And besides, plot holes are just pockets where the fanfiction lives. Number six, contrast. Oh, this is a big one. Contrast between characters is more important than you think. Particularly with voices, which can be extremely difficult if you're just starting out, but this goes for motivation, design, and skill set as well. It's harder to create contrast with large teams, but it isn't impossible. A trick for doing this is to think about how each character is smart. Not how smart each character is, but where their intelligence lives. Say you have two sneaky archers with shadowed pasts who both came from a nature-infused background. One might be more body smart, so they would excel at moving in such a way that their armor or clothes or footsteps don't make a sound. That person could then be a trainer of sorts for the other characters. The other might be a more nature smart, and be stealthy not because they're particularly agile, but because they know natural patterns well enough to move with them and blend in. That character might end up being the team's alchemist. Contrasting values is slightly easier. For example, Mordgood and Hegatha are basically the same build, but with opposite motivations. So they use their skills in very different ways. 
Having them on the same side long term wouldn't work out quite as well, but it could be done. And that's the point of having characters with really differentiated skills and moralities. They have to cover each other's butts. Nobody can do everything. Particularly in a large cast story like the Dawnbreakers, or a particularly crowded D&D campaign. Number 7. Good Villains. I forget which specific source I learned this from, but... The best villains share a goal with the protagonist, and can hurt them in a fundamental way. I could and might do a whole video on Hegatha just to expand on this point, but the short version of that video is that she, Arden, Ingrath, and Dominique all had the same goal in that arc, and that goal was Ingrath. This is why Hegatha got such a visceral response in the comments, while Harkon and Alduin and Mirak were all kind of like, oh hey, I know what's next, let's go kick his butt. She is definitely the best villain I've ever written in anything I've ever written, and for the next project, I kind of want to take this theory and apply it to some of the protagonists. As in, what if their very presence interflicts with each other? That's my favorite non-word, by the way. And it's a family heirloom! We'll see if I can pull it off or if it's even necessary, but yes, consider your villains, when and if you're planning your characters. Mercer Frey was such a good villain for Zaytest because we all know she's a squishy class cannon. Mirak was a decent endgame villain for Kinoa, but I could have made the similarities and conflicts between them even sharper in hindsight. This is probably one of the many reasons why the Companions questline isn't quite as rich and spicy as the others. There is no clear villain at the end of it. You end up fighting either the nebulous mass of the Silver Hand, or the player character's inner beast. Having identified that problem, maybe, just maybe, if I do another Companions character, I'll find a way to pull a good villain out of it. Number 8. Fun Beginnings Start with a fun character, even if you're not sure you can pull them off. Having fun goes a long way toward making you get better at your craft. Which is why I started with Arden, and plan to start the next story with a pirate singing sea shanties in prison. What counts as fun will probably be different for everyone. If you want to start with an Ingrath-like, lone, gunslinger, old western kind of hard-boiled character because that's fun for you, absolutely go for it. Number 9. Reactions versus Actions Reaction scenes are valid and useful. You don't have to have action all the time, and it can be a nice breather story-wise to just have characters sit down and discuss what happened and how they're feeling about it, especially if a big decision needs to be made because of it. On the other hand, Producing cutscenes the way I did for Dawnbreakers is mind-bogglingly time-consuming, so I may experiment with the next one and have reaction scenes accompanied by characters doing inventory management or crafting or something mindless like that where they can have a conversation while doing things. We'll see. It may or may not work. Which brings up another good point. Number 10. Experiment. Don't be afraid to experiment. Did I think I could pull off Ingrath's voice past that first episode? Absolutely not. Did I think I'd be writing full episode scripts and basically directing whole movies that had nothing to do with any Skyrim quest? Absolutely not! But episode 100 still exists, and is, I'd wager, the best one in the whole dang series. Number 11. Silence, my brother. Conversations naturally lapse. So having spaces in scripts, combat, or even travel for your characters to pause and breathe is actually pretty natural and keeps you from overheating your brain trying to be witty or fill space all the time. It's okay to be quiet. This message brought to you by a 9 out of 10 on the introversion scale. Number 12. Projection. Advanced writing tip. Projection is fun to play around with but really takes some thinking. Take a character's flaws and needs, and look at how they might see that in other people. This is much easier to do with the group of PCs, where you can write everyone's projections around each other and keep an opinions about the others list, but it can also be done with NPCs with a bit more foresight and research. An obvious example of this is Ingrath and Arden seeing the best parts of themselves in each other, but refusing to accept it until dire circumstances forced them to do some introspection. An example of flaws might be Arden and Yarnvita both calling each other stubborn and basically getting mad at each other for traits that they themselves embody. 
I didn't set out to do this, by the way. It sort of naturally evolved over time, but now that I understand the basics, I can keep it in the back of my head and look for things to do with it in the future. Number 13. Random character traits. Fun idea? Roll randomly on a personality test and write down the responses to generate a character. This is how I came up with one of my favorite characters that you all haven't met yet, Sol von der Ferein, the derelict Redoran. He first appeared as a character crusade challenge... character. I took the Which Dunmer House Are You quiz from the Elder Scrolls Online Morrowind promo and ended up with, well, House Redoran. I bring him up because he may end up being part of the next project. I'm gonna need to practice my Tildren Sero impression before I start trying to voice him, but just a little tidbit in case you're stuck on ideas for a character. The trick is not to make note of just the result, but also to write down some of the answers that you rolled for and then tinker with them until you've distilled some key personality traits. For Soul, those wound up being traditional, polite, reserved, and dedicated. He's also the origin of my favorite alignment, Lawful Grumpy. 14. Buffering. If you're gonna do something like what I'm doing, give yourself the benefit of a buffer zone. What I mean by that is pre-record and upload episodes ahead of time so that if stuff hits the fan in your real life, you can deal with that and maintain some kind of schedule. Fun fact, I recorded the last four or five episodes of Dawnbreakers, minus the finale, in the last week of October because I knew I'd be up to my eyeballs doing NaNoWriMo. And I was right. Obviously, this advice doesn't apply to streamers. You can't pre-record a stream. I wonder if that's why the premiere feature exists on YouTube. Hmm. But now you all know why I do pre-recorded videos. Number 15. Close your brackets. This is something I learned from a comic writing channel, McKay and Gray, I think, and it basically boils down to thinking about your plot the same way you'd think about formatting a chunk of text. I could do a whole video on this, but to boil it down to its simplest possible explanation, say you introduce a main character. You'd begin to format the story, kind of, with a C in brackets, like how you'd start to make something italic or bold in HTML or CSS. Then, say, there might be a questline involved, so you would introduce an event marker like E brackets or Q brackets, if you want to keep episodic things and quest lines separate. Maybe a mini-event outside of the questline happens, like when Kinoa lost her eye, that could be marked with an E bracket as well. The trick comes into play when you start wrapping up the story. Good practice is closing the formatting in the order you introduced it. So like, Arden's story would need to have been wrapped up last, since he was technically the first character introduced. But I played really fast and loose with all kinds of narrative rules that I didn't even know about starting out, so like, with a let's play, you have to be a bit more fluid. You can also mark location changes, like Arden coming to Skyrim from Bruma, or Yarnvita going to Falskar with a location bracket. This is so much more complicated to explain than I expected, so I'll see if I can find the video that I found and link it in the description for you. Or a pinned comment. Whichever one it ends up being. Hello, EJ from the future here. I neglected in my first pass of this to mention why one would want to go through all of this nonsense, and the reason is that it's a decent method for organizing stories that you want to keep condensed, like a comic or an overarching plot like the Hegesta storyline. For an example of this in actual use, here's my brackets for a comic that I sort of scripted but is perpetually on the back burner. First the main character is introduced, then a self-contained episode happens, then a conflict with another character happens, then a new self-contained event, then another character's storyline gets introduced, we enter a new country, a character-driven self-contained event happens, we find our new familiar territory and resolve one of the more minor character arcs, another self-contained event, a new character, a couple new events, and then we start to resolve the big things. In my actual planning document for this, I have things color-coded by arc, so it's a lot easier to deal with. Anyway. Number 16. Yes and no but. This is probably one of the best ways to do improv and roleplay. Leaving doors open to step through makes things more fun, even if it's more work. This goes especially for something like D&D, where there are other players involved, but you can do this with Skyrim as well. Just saying yes or no, particularly no, is like slamming a door in the face of the story. I have one really good example of a no that I probably shouldn't have done. Kinoa resurrected someone that she'd caught in the crossfire while taking out a lurker. Granted, my reasoning for it was that I didn't want to potentially break anything in the rest of the Mirak questline, 
but I didn't necessarily have to do that on screen. <laughs> by contrast, a good yes and was when Zaytest got nearly mauled to death by werewolves, and I used it as an opportunity to introduce Kinoa to her and Inigo. Or when Yarnvita took on a little bit too much with the Forsworn and Ingrath stepped in to save her life and cement himself as the Dawnbreaker's creepy vampiric guardian angel. I could have just done takes that didn't include those, but I kept them. That's yes and. No but is kind of like, more good having death visions. No, she didn't die, but she still has to find a way to tackle the problem that she just witnessed. Number 17. Don't start with hi. Writing advice that doubles as conversation advice. If you're writing a script, starting it with hi, or hey, or hello, and nothing else to go on is a great way to stall out, unless you're purposefully going for a kind of awkward encounter. Give the character a reason to talk to the other person. Ask a question, comment on the situation at hand, have one character go to them specifically for help, or scare them out of a state of focus, just whatever you do, don't just say hi. I've trashed many a first draft of a script because I got lost in small talk. Small talk does have its place, but I do my best to follow every greeting with a reason for it. Number 18, passive versus reluctant protagonists. Passive protagonists, that is, protagonists who go along with the plot only for the plot's sake, are frustrating to watch and also sometimes to play which is kind of why Yarnvita was a struggle at the very get-go, and Kinwa's weird off-journey to find Pelinol's old armor felt like such a slog. And I really don't know why, either. Reluctant protagonists are alright, but it seems to work better if they're reluctant because they had something else that they were going to do before getting derailed, which is why Arden's adventures with Barbas weren't as much of a drag as they could have been. It also gives you plenty of role-playing opportunities if they have something to complain about while they're doing this other thing that they now need to do. Which leads to my next tip. Number 19, character goals are powerful. Give them one. Even if it's as simple as, I want to find a way to repair the college, or I want to find my grandmother. There's a reason this is on so many tips for good characters lists. It also gives you, as the DM slash writer slash godhead of your story, something to work against. For an excellent and simple example, if your character's goal is to get a good night's sleep, start them in Raven Rock and see what happens. Number 20. Try the third thing. Sometimes the best way to build an interesting character is to subvert your own expectations of them right at the get-go. I didn't really do this as much when I was first planning Dawnbreakers, but it's something I'm actively thinking about going into my next project. I may have had another idea while I was working on the first one. Anyway, basically what I mean by try the third thing or subverting expectations is to take what kind of character you expect to do a certain thing and then make the character doing that thing very different. For example, what would one usually expect of a vampire lord in Skyrim? Well, you don't usually pick that path if you're playing a lawful good cinnamon role like Arden Welk. What would someone usually expect of someone joining the Thieves' Guild? I'd argue Zaytest, the sneaky, silver-tongued glass cannon, is exactly what most people would expect. And it's a very good example of why you don't necessarily need to do this. One subversion of that general expectation of the Thieves' Guild in particular, however, might be someone loud, brash, a bit dense, and generally clunky. Someone you might expect to join the Companions rather than the Guild. The challenge after that is giving them a reason to join said guild. And on that note, I think it's high time I wrapped this thing up. Thanks for watching, thanks again to all you wonderful patrons whose names may or may not be coming up on screen, we'll see. I hope it was useful, and if you'd like me to expand on any of these topics, feel free to leave a comment. I have no idea what the next video will be. I've just gotten to the end of the things that I had planned to write scripts for and do talks about. So, the I don't know what's coming next. I guess we're winging it from here. <laughs> and I believe the new year is going to be just after this video comes out, so uh, I might actually take a break for a while. On that note, I'll see you when I see you. Have fun.